I think that this may be one of the least <clears throat> chronological papers that we talk about, right? I mean, because it's, I mean, non in a while at least, yeah. <clears throat> Definitely in a while. Um, I guess, okay, so I should say for the listeners, so this is kind of a follow-up on, on Sartre, continuing the existentialism series. So we're discussing a lecture uh, in written form given by Sartre in 1946 entitled Existentialism is a Humanism. And uh, this, this, I don't know, this is going to be like, mm, excuse oh, me. It's, it might be important to note that he also developed it into a proper book, which we are not looking at. That is a good point. Yes. Because I know whenever I Googled it, like that <laughs> comes up first. Mm. But I'm not interested in, you know, the 200 pages or whatever. I can't remember if it was actually fairly short or fairly lengthy. It, it was it, it was around eight hundred pages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This okay. remember, awesome. remember 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 you said we, like, there, there's there's no way we're actually going to read something by Sartre <laughs> that's eight hundred pages. So. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, that is uh, that's extremely fair. Um, so I don't. I'm I'm honestly like interested to see how we actually end up talking about this because uh, it's a. I think Adam, you described it previously as like a very bold set of statements and claims. He's yes. kind of maybe what I'll do is I will venture a pass at something like a general motion towards what this is talking about. And then we'll try to get into the paper um, <clears throat> or the lecture, I guess. So basically Sartre here is talking about existentialism and he's defending it against some common but unfounded in his view criticisms and he first defines it yes he first defines it and then he defends it yes so. and he defines well, it well <clears throat> i was well, gonna say it feels yeah. like this whole project like this whole lecture is kind of also partly defining it um yes in yeah, his I think defenses it's so it's, it, yeah you're yeah. right you're right Yes, I think it's. I think he he definitely engages in both acts simultaneously, um, and he defends it against. I won't go into the criticisms because that's what we'll be talking about largely. But people seem to think that uh, existentialism suffers from sort of quietism or lack of action or despair. That's the first uh, uh, criticism. People also seem to think that it is exceedingly pessimistic or dreary or even kind of melodramatic in some sense. And that's the second criticism. And then the third is that people often accuse the existentialists of denying the reality and seriousness of human affairs. <clears throat> and Sartre pushes back on all three of those and, and argues for the exact opposite, in fact. Um, and this will be the last thing I say, and then we can talk about like our general <laughs> thoughts about it. But the main kind of vein running through this and seemingly most of Sartre's work in existentialism is this very, very well-known phrase, existence precedes essence. And so what Sartre, maybe in my estimation or my reading, means by that is that you, you're in this condition of finding yourself in the world before knowing what you are. And Sartre defines this as kind of the human condition. You must act before you are, or before you are who you'll end up as. You have to sort of live life in this creative act. Yep. And so you create yourself through the act of being, Sartre might say. And this is essentially why he believes that we have this radical notion of freedom that is so intense, it creates a state of nausea in people. Um, that's kind of the vein that I see running through all of this. I mean, if we want to take a step back, what did you guys, what were your general thoughts on? Because we read it. Um, we we all read this. And did we also all listen to the audio version of it? No. Okay. It's I, the, did, I mean, it's the same thing. Yeah. I listened to, <laughs> I, I, I kind of got sucked into this a little bit, I feel like, in a very almost vertiginous sense uh, where... I so I read so so we've got like a printout and all of these links will be in the description. So I read this and then I listened to it actually a few times and then I also listened to a few lectures about it um, by this professor 
and it's actually it's actually worth me taking the time to pull up um i think i might know exactly who you're referring to it was he from georgia uh georgia state or university of georgia uh i don't remember <clears throat> that part um Okay, let me let me just pull up my YouTube history real quick, because uh, it's it was actually so good. That's so Eric Dodson lectures, and I'll link this in the description below. But so uh, I listened to three or four lectures by him, just generally speaking about Sartre's philosophy, which was very enlightening. Um, so I I <clears throat> I almost feel kind of bottled up about this stuff, and I'm looking forward to actually like discussing it with someone. Yeah, well, I, did not, I, I, I did not go that far. I read the paper twice. So, and I've got lots of questions. So yeah, it'll be, <laughs> be good. It'd be good to dive in. General positivity or negativity about it. What did you think? Um, I would say generally positive because it's, it's a pretty interesting thesis, but there are some issues where I feel like he doesn't address some criticisms mm. um, to existentialism, like such as, you know, if we were to kind of like jump into one of his earliest ideas, it's that like in the process of defining one's essence, you know, you pretty much, <clears throat> you foist that view upon humanity as a whole. Yes. So, and, and, and I, and I wrote down, I, I don't, I don't see why you do. I don't see why you do. Like I, because he, he says, you know, throughout, I'm just paraphrasing here that when one chooses, one chooses for all of humanity. So, and I, and I don't see why. I, I, I read his, his response, which is he says largely that, okay, you know, one could respond to me and say that, well, all of humanity doesn't choose as I choose, or mm -hmm. they all wouldn't. And he thinks that those are sort of kind of lame kind of bad faith responses. bad faith responses i don't think so i yes. don't i just yes. don't think so i don't i don't understand because it, it it doesn't necessarily follow that everyone will choose what i choose in fact people choose quite the opposite and although i might wish that much of humanity might you know choose in the same way that i choose in some instances i don't feel that i'm choosing for all of humanity in my actions I don't, I, I don't, yes, yeah, I, I yeah. actually, I was very, I was very confused by this too. Let's put a tiny pin in that real quick. Yeah. Cause I, that we'll circle right back around yeah. to that. Cause it's a fine place to start. Giffa, what are your general thoughts about this? Um, <clears throat> I'd say generally positive, but, um, within like the framework of like, it was interesting that it introduced a certain discussion that was, you know, happening at the time. Yeah. Um, it, I liked it better than nausea. I'll say. <laughs> Whereas I think nausea was successful basically only as psychological mm. work and like very muddled as like a novel, you know, and as a narrative and philosophically, this one was a little bit clearer, but also still has <laughs> elements that are disagreeable to probably all of us. Um, but still, I find it successful. And, you know, generally I was positive on it. Upon reading this, it almost made me, it didn't change my view of nausea, but it made me slower to condemn it, I guess. Um, me too. Me too. I, 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 and I told Jordan this, um, hmm. but I wish we had read this before reading nausea. I totally just, agree. Just because I think <laughs> I, I, I would have given the book a more fair shake. Um, I mean, it's not that I didn't read the book carefully. It's that I didn't understand what it was going for. Like, it, 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 it's like, it's like I was, I, I feel like if I would have read this first, I would have been searching in the book for these different points of philosophy that he's trying to just, you know, write about in this. I mean, it, nausea is, I'm sure he's trying to capture a lot of these ideas in this paper. Hmm. Um, I'm not so you, sure, to be honest. Like, I, I do think it would have benefited, but to be honest, so I had, I think I was the one who suggested this specific paper to read next. Um, but right, this is yeah. because I, because I was listening to the audio version um, of a couple of things. Um, I got recommended this on YouTube, but then, so I listened to it while we were still in the middle of nausea. 
So like oh. after like the first part, I had listened to like I'd say three quarters of this paper on the audio version, and it still was ridiculously confusing, confusing to me. Like I don't think it succeeds. It may wait, there may you, be wait, ideas. You mean me. you mean nausea or this was confusing? <clears throat> no nausea. Like oh, okay, nausea okay. was not made that much better for me having like been experienced even like in a less um, rigorous way than like an actual discussion to this paper. Hmm. I think I would have understood my frustration better though with Antoine. Like I would have understood that, you know, like in this paper, I, I don't want to jump the gun here, but I mean, I mean, he does propound in one section that, you know, not making a choice is a choice, right? So like a lot of the time, like, you know, yeah. failing to act on Antoine's part was a choice and a reflection of his character. Yeah. And that he... I, I knew that he wasn't he wasn't a protagonist and he did, he wasn't written as a protagonist, but I feel like I would have seen him in more of an interesting light than just like an annoying character. You know what I mean? Because I don't know. If no, you guys, I think that's I, I, that's fair. I don't know if you guys just felt frustrated with Antoine a lot of the time. Like there was like a certain frustration for me when reading his character, <laughs> yes. but but he would have been more interesting, I think. How do I yeah. read this verse? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I think you're you're right. Um, like to be fair, I like listened to you know much less intensely. It was kind of like casual listen. Um, so I was exposed to some of the ideas, but um, I don't know. Um, not, not I think Naja as a work Can failed I... because you kind of have to read so much into it, like from yeah. other p- places to fill in. I was going to say, but that, anyway, that, that's but fair at least, yeah. Uh, sorry i was gonna say can i so <clears throat> maybe i can like throw a few kind of themes that stuck out to me uh on the table and then we can talk about them as we please um, Sure. yeah we can so <clears throat> and, and if and if you guys saw some things that i glossed over i mean feel free to obviously add them but the the main themes of this paper that i found interesting were that so obviously there's the core kind of vein that runs through it which is that existence precedes essence but then there's also this and adam just brought it up there's this weird question of the universality or sort of generalizability or categorical nature of choice that i was very confused by and adam tabled that uh, already and then there's the, there's also this sense in which you have to invent your own values um which i found really interesting too and there's also this, you know, kind of leading from the fact that existence precedes essence. There's this radical freedom that Sartre endorses. And <clears throat> almost following from that is there, there are these kind of multiple themes where you can only count on yourself, where you're sort of only sure of your own actions in some sense um, because of like the radical nature of this freedom. So I think that we can, I mean, Adam, you already brought up like the universalizability question. So we can definitely just talk about that. I, I have a quote, if you want me to read that about the, the choice. Yeah, sure. Go for it. <clears throat> I found this very interesting. So Sartre says, the existentialist frankly states that man is in anguish. His meaning is as follows. When a man commits himself to anything, fully realizing that he is not only choosing what he will be, but is thereby at the same time a legislator deciding for the whole of mankind. I, 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 was vi- I, I had many, many question marks next to that highlight. And I, I found the retorts to Sartre to be more convincing than what he said there in the sense that, you know, you already said this, Adam, like, you know, people will respond to that. Okay. Well, no, actually like many people will choose very different things. And when I'm confronted with any given choice, I don't feel as though I'm choosing for all of mankind. I feel like I'm choosing for me in this specific circumstance now. And I, I, I don't know. I failed to see how (laughs) it's like, it, it, I kind of like combined his view <clears throat> later on when he talks about the choices one makes in the moral realm is almost like an art piece where yes. you're kind of like forming this, this art piece over time based on the choices and the way one constructs their life. And like, I, so how does this relate to what you just said? Well, I kind of like, I got the visual like on like the second read through of almost like this tableau where it's like, you know, individual people make up like the tableau of humanity in such that any different era or epoch, as he puts it, you know, you might see like, 
okay, what does the United States look like right now? And it's like, you know, the behavior of individuals, 330 million people, right? So it makes up like this panorama of just individual decision or individual decisions make up this panorama of the whole. So I understand how he says that like our individual behavior is almost like a reflection of the whole. And in a way we are choosing in a sense what that picture looks like Mm. ultimately. So I do understand that, but it, it seems the angst that he, you get what I'm going for there. Yeah. But, but like the, <laughs> angst, but, but, but like the angst behind it and just, um, or what's his exact word? Like, is that, is that the anguish? Oh, oh, anguish, anguish, anguish. Yeah. Yes. I, I don't get the anguish from that as an individual. Like I, I, but I, I hope that kind of gave like an interesting visual, at least that, that that's kind of how I was. No, I a hundred percent agree. Cause I was actually going to, oh. Well, I, I was going to pull in another quote from him. Um, I don't think it's on the same page. I wasn't sure where you were reading from Jordan, but um, this informed like my perspective of the kind of <laughs> you're responsible for humanity question. And it's on a similar vein to Adams. Um, but then I also was curious, Jordan, if you had any prior experience with like some of this literature, because I actually don't. Um, but basically at the bottom of what what is my page seven, he says, um, I cannot base my confidence upon human goodness or upon man's interest in the good of society, seeing that man is free and that there is no human nature, which I can take as foundational. So to me, the, mm-hmm. I, like his conversation about like your de- condemning humanity was kind of like a part of a conversation about like the idea of human <clears throat> nature. It's like there, if you believe that there is a human nature and that's kind of just like a fixed foundational thing, whereas he's kind of rejecting that and saying, no, like whatever we do constitutes human nature, right? Like we will discover what human nature is as, you know, we act. So it's, it sounded like in a similar vein to what Adam was describing. It, like it's very, it's dis- very similar. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I, I almost kind of like get the sense that, you know, taken to its extreme, kind of going back to the visual of it all, of kind of like the picture of what humanity looks like. You can imagine that and like, obviously this is taken to the extreme, but what if you had 330 million, you know, enlightened kind of just consequentialist, you know, you know, just people who cared about others who were, you know, who had robust, you know, frameworks such as empiricism and, you know, I, I don't know, whatever, but, but then you have someone that is just like Satan spawn, you know what I mean? Just, Think of how they would mar the overall picture. You know what I mean? Just that single <clears throat> imperfection in the overall picture. Yeah, you that, wouldn't be that, able to say that humankind is all of the things that the 99% is because, you know, you have that example. Yeah, because you it's almost like, a, you know, a drop of errant ink on, you know, um, like mm. a Van Gogh or, or on like a, you know, a Picasso where it just seems out of place at that point. So... Even, even like, you know, a, you know, a small individual could hmm. define humanity in some way. But, but I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I buy it, though. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying if, I, think, I think this is what he's going for. I don't yeah, know. If he means exclusively the idea that, like, kind of I brought up where it's like, you know, because there is no foundational human nature thing, then, like, we just kind of are, you know, the human nature is whatever humans do. Then it's mm. like, I, okay, I kind of buy that. That's more of like just a kind of a perspective shift or a definition kind of, you know, tinging. Um, but if he means something like grander than that, then it, it falls apart for me. <laughs> and I definitely don't quite agree with like the whole anguish that comes from this as if like the, like truly the weight of the world is on your shoulders. And it's like, well, <laughs> I, I almost found the anguish to come from the exact opposite uh, mm. sense because so, I mean, he, you know, I, I don't think this is a, an analytic text in the sense that you can be like, haha, refuted. I have found a contradiction within it. But there were some things that I found, and maybe I can, because he, he talks about, I mean, there is this almost like radical individuality to choice that I thought was in tension. Maybe I don't want to say contradiction, but with that type of anguish where, like the anguish for me is that, you know, when faced with kind of his radical notion of like self-invention via choice, it's actually an extremely 
isolating endeavor. Like no one can help you make that choice. Um, and he like brings kind of aspects of that up later in the paper. So the thing that I was confused about is um, like that disconnect, I guess. How, how one chooses for himself, but suddenly chooses for others who yeah. also choose for themselves. Uh, so there's so. like, there, there's like a really basic local interpretation of that. But I, but I took Sartre to, to be saying more than this, which is that like, okay, what he, he could be saying like, well, when I make a decision, I am acting as though I believe that everyone, if they found themselves in my particular situation in which I have to make this decision, they should choose or they ought to choose as I also choose, right? But he seemed to be saying more than that, in my opinion. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, he, he, yeah. He, but, I, but I can't pin down exactly like the grander sense that he meant it in, but it seemed grander. Yeah, it, it is a sense, but not like an articulated kind of principle. There, there were vibes that were like <laughs> co co core to the like foundation of this paper, but I don't. And the weird thing is, is like I feel them, but I don't know how to express them fully in some ways. I don't know. Given I, I wanna, I wanna just bring up a very small tangent here. But did you have some of like okay. the? I guess the same apprehension or just dislike of his kind of eschewing of human nature and just kind of rejecting the concept of human nature i mean don't don't you think that i i, I had like scientific misgivings about about his his rejection of the concept of human nature mm. in certain respects i did not upon reading it you know you may easily change my mind because oh, I like i said did. i i was reading it as like a like i said and i actually don't know if this is even accurate but like i feel um, that human nature kind of was almost a metaphysical concept, um, you know, being introduced, not, not by Sartre, but like that he was bringing into the conversation as a kind of a prior um, in other philosophies and that he was kind of rejecting that notion. Now that may be incorrect, but that was kind of like how I was able to square it, but there were plenty of ways to square this. Um, or well, I, I got that, that it can be squared. Well, the, the thing is, like, I, I thought that his point was that human beings can ultimately be anything, anything they choose to be. Yeah. And I, oh, no, I, I see what you're saying. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, obviously, I, the, yeah. the radical freedom is simply rejected. No, no, so. no. no I, I don't even mean that, but I just okay. mean that aren't there, aren't there sort of, you know, some social species principles? that kind of allow a lot of freedom of movement in what we are, but fundamentally there are some things we can't be. Like I found a little bit of external research about that in the okay. lecture series. Okay. Yeah. Ooh. I don't know if this illuminates anything, but so I, I know, and I don't know where, cause like, you know, Sartre's works are, are vast, but I do know that he admits that, um, the example that that professor used did you guys ever watch that sh that show i dream of genie that like very antiquated show oh shoot okay well basically you, okay you know the concept of a genie is obviously they just kind of like blink and nod and like something appears right okay sure. um sartre elsewhere not in this work uh grants that we don't have that sort of freedom like we're not gods in a sense right so okay. he's almost so but this this is like this introduces like kind of slippery questions that I don't know how he would answer. So he admits that we're, we don't have godlike powers, but he also seems to say in this work that we actually are constantly confronted with the choice to be anything, but within some sort of bounds. Now, I don't know mm. what establishes the bounds, though, because he's he you're right, Adam, he does like rail against human nature in a very confusing way so the bounds are broader than human nature for sartre but what is in between human nature and godlike powers that would be the bounds like i don't understand how he kind of squares that view yeah i i just i i agree with that and it's it seems like he did he wasn't really considering the concept that human nature itself is not you know, just a, a litany of, you know, 
prescriptions about how humans should behave, how they ought to, you know, mm. how like, what they are. But more so, it's it's a very very broad and you know culturally dependent. But there's a ton of features and overlap just given like our evolutionary history. Like, I, I don't want to like bring all that stuff just into sort the of conversation, background facts. but yeah. exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> there are background facts of this that, you know, okay, why, why are we empathetic beings? You know, is there a possibility that we could all be unempathetic? Beings? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like it, is, is that possible? He almost, um, he almost seems to, he almost seems to deny uh, that, that, mental aspects are not metaphysically different than physical aspects of yourself you know what i mean like he, he almost seems to believe like the, the analogy there would be like you could choose what height you ultimately grow to in some yeah. sense yeah. he almost has that view of human um cognition and or emotions and or character traits yeah and this kind of this, this very much gets into one of the themes you brought up there about choosing one's values yeah yeah, yeah I, I i think we should kind of get into that okay, one real, real quick can i um the the weird thing is is that um I, there was also a weird tension for me in what you said about the kind of universalizability of choice there you know um so that is okay like obviously my um my understanding or sort of grasp of like all of philosophy is very limited, right? But it reminded me of Kant's categorical imperative. Well, he brings it up. Yes. Yeah, I mean, he... He does. He, yeah. Because um, like for people who don't know, like, you know, Kant has these maxims uh, that, you know, state act only on that maxim by which you could will your action to become a universal law. And that sounds extremely similar to what he's talking about with choice. But then the weird thing is that he rails against, um, you know, all of these, um, you know, Nietzsche kind of talks about this too, right? Where there are these kind of prescriptions of like one grand theory of, you know, ethics, how to act or like um, scientific realism, like the nature of reality. There are these kind of like grand theories that put forth and they're too simplistic. And that seemed to be echoed by Sartre when he talked about, you know, like you can't use Kantian ethics or consequentialism or like the Bible or whatever, like to, to um, tell you what to do. And so again, there is that weird tension there. With like, this I, and whole, I, yeah, yeah, I thought he actually brought up a really good point with that too. Whenever he was, uh, I mean, he brought up a very interesting case where, you know, a boy came to him <laughs> You know, and this would have been during the war, I think in 1940, yes. um, where the boy's older brother had died fighting the Germans. And the boy's father in France was a collaborator. So he must have been working with the Germans. Mm. And his mother, as a result, was extremely distraught about the circumstances. So, but the boy was unsure should I stay with my distraught mother? Or should I go avenge my brother in war? And, and the situation is, you know, a little more complicated than that. But the point is, is that, you know, the boy comes to Sartre for advice. On like, <laughs> what, what should I do? And like Sartre makes an interesting point where he's like, okay, no system of ethics, at least that he knows of, or that I know of also as well, can tell you what's the right decision there. Mm. So, and the more interesting point is that people, and this is, and this kind of like echoes Dostoevsky to a point, but people act as they wish, right? At the end of the day, you know, you make decisions based on what you will, and that's it. And you brought up, okay, you could go consult a priest, but perhaps you already guessed the answer there. Or maybe you yes. adopt a, a system of consequentialism. But, you know, what if, what if, in fact, you reached an answer with consequentialism that you don't, in fact, endorse? Well, you might actually recall a different ethical theory in which you reach an answer that gives you exactly what you were thinking is or what your intuition is right. So it's this, you know, he criticizes like these systems of ethics because he says like, OK, none of them should tell you how you behave. Because ultimately, people choose 
you know, either advisors or people of wisdom or, you know, frameworks that kind of already map on yeah. to their intuitions. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. If and, you're and religiously it, leaning, you go to the priest, you know, if you're not, you go to like your school counselor or something. I right? had this like triple underlined and starred and highlighted. It was actually genius. It's a, good, it's, a, it's a very good point. It's a yeah. genius point because this is like, this is one of those points where it's almost didactic how he makes it where you've actually subconsciously, this, this is my experience at least, I've subconsciously known this is true my entire life, but I would have never articulated it in the way he does, where he says that this isn't verbatim, but he goes, you know, the choice is actually made far before speaking with whomever you <sighs> ask advice of it is in who you go to for advice you've already made up your mind if you go to a priest you know he even says there are two different types of priests there are those who kind of remain conservative within you know not choosing sides, and there are those who radically stake their flag on the ground early on and if you go to one of those priests you know what response you will get and that dude, you that still hit, go it hit me like a truck because i was like that is one of the most true things I've ever heard. When you choose the advice of someone, you already know to some extent, to a great extent, the type of advice you will get back. Yes. Yeah. So you're yes. already kind of choosing there. You're so searching for just validation or confirmation. Yeah, exactly. no, that was a very, very, very good point. Um, and before I forget, because Adam, you mentioned Dostoevsky. Well, he quotes, I think this is sh shortly before where you quoted, um, but... Sartre writes, Dostoevsky once wrote, if God did not exist, everything would be permitted. Um, and that, for existentialism, is the starting point. So this kind of relates to what we were talking about in terms of like value picking. It's like, mm. <laughs> in a way, everything is permitted, right? And the radical freedom shows up there too, yeah. It does, yeah. So this is Sartre quoting Dostoevsky, but in like a kind of a agreement with a fat like laying the foundations here which again make, makes it appropriate that we started with dostoevsky mm. definitely definitely because he so so he ends the story of the you know the the boy choosing where he says i'm quoting him now i had but one reply to make you are free therefore choose that is to say invent no rule of general morality can show you what you ought to do no signs are vouchsafed in this world so i was just I, I, you know, I was kind of laughing at that where you almost wonder like, okay, given what Sartre said, like, I wonder what that student was going to, to Sartre with the expectation of. Um, I mean, I wonder, you know, he could have known that Sartre would reply in that manner as well. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like, um, what, what do you, okay. What do you guys make of that point writ large? Um, I think he's exactly right. At I, first, I, I, yes. Yeah, I, I think he's exactly right. I think even if I were to, you know, attempt to, okay, so say like I had like a very robust system of ethics. I've, you know, I'm at a different, you know, maybe three months from now, if we just dive into ethics and like this consequentialism that's just like very robust. If I reach an answer that just like doesn't align with my intuitions, okay, well, then I'm just still, still probably going to behave intuitively, right? So I, I just think that, you know, I either will choose, you know, a system of ethics or someone to seek advice from that will tell me what I want to hear or, you know, consciously or subconsciously, or um, I will maybe just like reject the system of ethics if I don't like intuitively kind of like, you know, uh, align with it. I definitely think <laughs> that could be the case. It turns all these like, I, you get the impression that like all of these kind of like choices are almost like to a large part just self-discovery, right? If you're viewing it with that lens, like as you're like, you know, thinking about it and observing that it doesn't align or does align with your intuitions or the, observing the choices that you make it's like there is a lens where it's just like huh like you're you're discovering who you are in this case as well and his and his point goes even broader or like 
broader slash deeper than that too, where even when you do, because that's true. And also, even when you do act explicitly on a sort of ethical maxim, you have to make the choice to do that. It's not yeah, like you're, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Because like, because like I've had those moments too, where I almost like I recognize what the right thing to do is, and I almost like very begrudgingly do it. Do, do you know what I mean? And, but like, yeah. but like you actually have to just make the choice either way. I, I and it's dude, it's. Uh, yeah, it's kind of disconcerting whenever you're like realizing that like you you ascribe to a certain like, you know, you know, even if it's a vague ethical framework, then you feel like the conflict and you're like, oh, no, <laughs> like it, it it is. I mean, maybe this does bring anguish, but it's like I subscribe to this. It, you know, is telling me to do this, but I don't want to do this like and I <laughs> that that is unsettling. This goes to the question of pessimism, I guess. Um, so it was actually a very interesting experience because we pushed the recording date back two days, right? So I kind of stewed on this for a while. And I was kind of, because I told you, I got like sucked into this in a big way. Mm. So I was, um, I was actually like kind of just imbibing this it, throughout like my daily, you know, just kind of life for the past two days. And it was like a very absurd experience where psychologically speaking, he, he's actually like profoundly and startlingly correct that everything is a choice. Like literally everything is a choice within the bounds of physics almost. Like Adam, yeah. I remember you and I had this like one conversation one time. This was like years ago, but I still remember it where we were just discussing like, I mean, this sounds like unhinged out of context, but we were just, we were discussing just like the raw absurdity of the fact that like, no one's preventing you from doing anything at any given time. Where like, you know, this was like pre COVID, we were having this conversation, but you could literally just be like, you know, just kind of like Monday morning at your desk. And you could literally just like do anything you wanted to at, at, at that moment, but you just choose not to. <laughs> Like you could do anything at that moment, yeah. like literally true. anything. Just and rampage should... through the office like a gorilla if you wanted to. You could do. I mean, it, it sound it's at that point could literally sound anything. like very very banal, but if you actually like embody, it's very very disturbing that you could do anything within the laws of physics. You could walk into your boss's office and ask for a raise. You could walk into your boss's office and just like drive a staple through his hand. Like you could. Like you could <laughs> It's just like, it, like it, literally anything that is within the laws of physics is open to you psychologically. Yeah. It, it's, I, I don't know why, but like the depth of that point, like really sank in over the past few days. No, I agree. It, it, it can be crazy when it hits you. Just like it's, it, I, I, I mean, I know this isn't exactly what you're saying, um, but I still recall like back in high school when I was first learning to drive. Like when I was like behind the wheel, I, I just like, I, I'm like, it like terrified me because like, I'm, I knew that it was like within my power. Like if I just like suddenly did just like made the choice suddenly to just like turn the wheel, I could like kill everybody in the car and yeah. kill and kill the person. Like, and like, and I just felt that within my power. Like I had never felt that within my power that like suddenly like that was a real like choice. I could make, yes. yes. you know, so, there's like, actually nothing stopping you. Or like when you're like on like, you know, just a very high ledge, you just recognize you could jump. Yeah. Yes. You could. You could jump. Like you don't, obviously, but <laughs> just but raw just... recognition of the absurd possibilities. Exactly. exactly. They hate you. <sighs> yeah. This, this this almost this almost this reading almost induced like a mania in me at times. It it really did. Where okay, I, I don't remember if I've I don't think we talked about this on the podcast. I don't think so. But like the, Nietzsche has this idea that <clears throat> um, <clears throat> like to admit something is true to yourself is unseparable from a call to action. So like if you admit something is wrong in your life or you admit like the recognition that you wish something were different is actually very, very difficult for people to do, not because it's untrue, but because it's truth actually is like unable to be uncoupled from a call to action. 
And like that imported onto this context is kind of insane where it's actually made me realize that like people's worldviews are probably shaped to a large extent by like not only what they actually believe is true in like a very narrow kind of like epistemic rationality sense, but it people probably like sh- have their beliefs and like almost worldview shaped by what they are prepared to do. In the sense that like, okay, <clears throat> it's like, I mean, this, this is like a, obviously like a, personalized example if you admit to yourself that you're not happy in your job Mm -hmm. the admittance of that fact is actually not just sort of a statement of fact it's like it's actually a call to action do do, do you know what i mean like you can't actually separate those two things and so like the call was strong enough for me obviously but like what if it was on the kind of like knife's edge of strength there do you know what I mean? You can kind of like subconsciously hide away from that in such as like, no, you know, kind of like bad faith um, way of viewing things. I don't know. That just struck me as like very, very, it made me look at people differently. It made me look at people differently where people are walking around with this very just um, homogenous mix of straight up propositional beliefs but they're always just kind of shadowed and graded and changed by what people are prepared to do in a way that strikes me as like very irrational but true do you think it's like like prepared to do i'm because i'm trying to like relate it to the point you just brought up there about people deceiving themselves because it's almost like they're they're turning away from what's true uh, but is that like an active thing they're doing on their part or kind is of that not. yeah it just yeah. seems like it seems like it operates in a fuzzy zone between like conscious and non-conscious it's, it's like pe- it's it almost it, like the analogous thing to me seems like your peripheral vision it's like kind of over there and you can choose to either turn and look at it or turn away and not see it at all. Yeah. There's almost like a, an inkling or an intuition. It's like, it's very, yeah. it's, it's below the level of conscious thought. Like, um, you know, so like in, in the text, Sartre says like pe- people, uh, you know, would just tell themselves like these, he says, deterministic stories. Um, about how they're actually like not free. Oh, well, I, you know, I can't quit my job. Like, and they'll come up with all these reasons. And like, some of them may be true. Some of them may be not like, I have a family or whatever. Like oh, I've been yeah. at the company. It'd be too hard to change or whatever. Do you, you know what I mean? Like, I, I wonder if, a, excuse me. I wonder if a lot of that is happening below the conscious level. Yeah. I, I, I get the, my intuition is that like, it's kind of nestled within this kind of like, habit forming notion of us where like once the the idea enters the periphery which you know maybe subconscious it's like you you've already developed the kind of instinct to turn away right because you don't want to engage with something that's going to require like you know foundation shaking kind of aspects but some part of you can recognize that it would so you know turn turn open oh, turn you know yeah. what i mean because like that's kind of how i am conceptualizing it to just confront yeah, with yourself. Yes, yes. Because think about it. To actually confront yourself with the raw admittance that you are not happy in a situation. And the consequences of that. Yes, <laughs> It's yes. Not, not easy. Yes. Yo, it's so Especially it's like so in the difficult. example you gave, if you got like a family and stuff, like <laughs> that's, a, that's a brutal, like, <laughs> if possible, mm. reconciliation. What you said, Giffen, actually made me think of one of my... Um, like questions, I guess, about this paper. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me, I'm curious if you guys agree, he, um, in his focus on radical freedom and like radical choice, it was interesting to me that um, I thought he undercut the importance of something like kind of virtue development or like your character. Um, Because he he almost says explicitly at one point, I don't remember where this is in the the text, but he says that like, you know, people often act from... um, 
he doesn't say instinct, but he says sort of people act in a very unreflective manner. And he says, you know, obviously that's a choice too, to be unreflective in your actions. But um, I almost wondered if like his, you know, because you can't, you can't, like I, I kind of tried this as like a psychological thought experiment where I actually tried to like from time to time deliberately choose everything that I was both doing and not doing. Do you know what I mean? Like I am going to, I don't know, like, you know, take a sip of this right now at the expense of not taking a sip or choosing to take a sip of water, which I probably should have at this point. Right. But like, right. Okay. But if you did every, if you did everything in that mental state, it would be like, instead of existence precedes essence, it would be like existence precedes exhaustion. Like you'd be so tired from that, that like constant state of like mentally choosing everything. I almost wonder if he undercuts the importance of um, kind of like character development in that sense. Do you mean like- um, I'm not, Yeah, I'm not sure yeah, I understand Yeah, yeah, fully. yeah. So are you talking about just like, continuity at that point where it's like past behavior influences future behavior in the sense that you're not you know you do make decisions consciously at points that then influence sort of um just subconscious behavior throughout your daily life or because like you're talking about like you don't make decisions consciously all the time like you don't consciously yeah. decide to act and not <laughs> to act so when you're talking about character building are you talking hmm. about, okay, the conscious choices you have made or the subconscious choices you have made, you know, combined those two influence decisions now? Like, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. It's like he, he, he's sort of like hyper-focused on the act of choosing. And it's yeah. all about just like doing that and like the importance of that. And I don't know. It's like, um, like William James, who we should read, wrote a lot about like habit and the importance of habit. Mm. Uh, and he, he has this like awesome quote where he says, it's the flywheel of civilization. <laughs> where, <laughs> Very much. Yeah. Where, it, you know, um, like it's based like the fact that I don't know how to actually tie my shoes, but yet I can do it. Like, I actually don't, I kind of don't know how that happens, but I just do it. You know what I mean? Um, there are the analogous thing is that I'll react to certain people or certain situations or certain emotions in that like very reactive way too. Right. And I, I just wonder if like, if you're kind of focused on the phenomenon of choice in the way that Sartre is, you undercut the importance of developing like non-conscious reactions to things. Um, I, I think I think choices precede habits, though. I do believe that. I mean, it's like, like for example, like you, I, I think there's a pretty active choice on my part the first time I go to the gym, or the or, or the first time yes. I break a diet. You yes. know what I mean? Yes. That, yes. that I slip back into that. <laughs> like, there, there's definitely a choice in the sense that Sartre is talking about that precedes those moments before mm. habits build. So, well, yeah. so, so that's totally right. It almost seems though as though Sartre would sort of degrade or like negate the importance of all of the like the 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 diet breaking or the gym non going that happens afterwards, but it's sort of like I don't know I, maybe maybe it's just like a difference in tone that I'm pointing to that you could have, but it's sort of like oh I almost like want I don't know you you almost want certain things to be below the level of conscious choice certainly things like tying your shoes but now i'm even thinking about like I, or stopping even going to the gym. Stop, oh yeah exactly like yeah, okay, yeah something like that i mean you still have to choose to go to the gym you got to keep up that i mean yes you know habitual behavior makes it easier the mm -hmm. choice but without a doubt when i was going to the gym semi-regularly it was like okay i i don't necessarily want to go tonight but I, I got to keep it up, you know, or on my way back home, running by Taco Bell. It's just like, <laughs> it's like I, I, you know, suddenly so, so the decision, the decision presents itself, you know what I mean? And it's like, 
I, I've stopped by there many times before. So the, so there's the habits in place. The warm but, embrace. Yeah, the but, warm <laughs> embrace. but but certainly I, I do I do distinctly recognize a choice being made there. Like I, you know, and we can debate how radically free that choice is. Yeah, but mm-hmm. I, but, but I I, <laughs> right. I even even in the face of habit, because suddenly, you know, maybe a month from now or maybe tomorrow. I'll break that habit. You know what I mean? And a choice will be made. So I don't know. Yeah. So to your question, Jordan, like whenever I was reading this, I, I my impression is more so that like Sartre wanted to want you to like recognize that like even your kind of habits are choices and kind of reflect on that. I don't know if he like necessarily is trying to like take away the element of habit entirely. I think it was more, it was very much like reflect on this reality. Like, I don't know if that, yeah, I, I, you were... I completely with, I agree with Giffen on this point here, because it's like, I get I'm so sorry to cut you off there, but, but <laughs> you're but so thing... right. You don't need to keep no, talking. No, 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 Shut no, your no, mouth and let me explain. No, no, you're so right. Because he, he's saying like, he's presenting it as you really, you really could start eating well tomorrow. It's perfectly within bounds and it's perfectly within bounds for you to start like working out. In yeah. fact, you are completely free to do that tomorrow. You're so free to I, do that after we end recording. You're free to do it now, literally right now. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry, Giffen, but I, I just had to because I, I completely agree with what you were saying there. Okay, no, no, oh. no, no worries. Um, I think I was nearly done with the thought, anyways. But yeah, like I, <laughs> that's I made like, sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> that was not in your choice. <laughs> you know, like that's kind of what I viewed this um, as, not like. I don't know that he perhaps he actually does. And maybe you, Jordan, you listen to like a video where, you know, someone described like from his other work, like Sartre's insights or even from like maybe the book version of this um, on like the kind of consciousness element. Um, and maybe there'd be like, you know, things we would disagree with there mm-hmm. um, with Sartre. But at least for like in terms of like in this, you know, what 17 page paper. Um, which is just a transcript from a speech. Mm-hmm. I very much think this was like, it, actually, especially in light of the fact that this is a kind of public lecture, right? This wasn't something given to like grad students. This was something given to the public. That actually is important context. True. I very much think this is kind of like reflect on these like elements, reflect on these realities. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it's not, you, you <laughs> may bring up the fact that like, oh, well, like, you know, I, I, I wasn't really consciously thinking about it. I just, you know, you just end up at Taco Bell every night. <laughs> <laughs> um but like you know like you those are choices and you choose to to, to not act to change it as well yeah, yeah. It, it, i don't it's, think it's, he yeah. said comments much more on that it's very like yeah yeah it, it was like a <clears throat> it was just something like, that occurred what he me. would say because yeah. um well actually let's continue on i have another yeah. point i'm, I'm, make I'm also end. starting to view it more as like um this is almost like a state of mind that Sartre Mm. wants us to adopt in a lot of ways here where it's like, you know, anything is possible. Like in the sense that he's, I I bet if you were to like, I mean, I'd have to read more of his, but I'm starting to get the sense that it's, he he has issue with people kind of like falling back onto like deterministic, like, like thoughts, not in the sense that like, okay, that might be actually true. But that actually does prevent you in a lot of ways from like seizing hold of your own life in a lot of ways. Like if you just- Excuses, you're right. It's like a lot of excuses, excuses, but he says like, okay, let's set that all aside for a second. You in fact can change right now and it's completely within your power. Yes. And and it's it's almost a little like motivational in a lot of senses. Like that's the optimistic yeah. side. So yeah. I was yeah. gonna ask you guys, I was gonna ask you guys r- reading this, I said earlier, it induced almost like a like a quasi-manic state in me. Mm. But like <clears throat> Dude, I, I, I'm not even just saying this. I've actually been more aggressive in like the possibility of choices that were presented to me in the couple of days since reading this. Um it, in a way that I don't know, like, I don't know. We've had so many of these conversations in the past, but it's just sort of like, ah, oh, the, there's yes. this really like, there's this really ineffable feeling that this induces in me. No, I where... think psychologically, like 
Sartre is really able to drill into you. And I think that was kind of the case in nausea, except like, you know, in a different way. But it, yeah. yeah, I mean, it was kind of like, here's a disturbed psychology um, where here's like, I'm like pitching a very like kind of worthwhile frame of mind to consider. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like an advocation for being less risk averse <laughs> in some sense. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Um, it very much like he, he does kind of put a grand scale on the idea of like develop yourself and humanity at the same time. Right. Yeah. I, and, I, and, and, to, and to be more active in making decisions. Right. Like, yes. cause, cause, yes. cause I mean, it's just like, you know, to not act is to make a decision not to act. The very so, first so thing. So act. That, like, yeah, the very so, first thing. Which, yeah. Which, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just like bursting with excitement here, which Good. actually like um, kind of kind of revisiting the discussion about Annie's perfect moments in this oh. context actually made it just like it, it, it slapped 10 times harder there where it was just like, okay, you're actually like, you don't even know which moments are really kind of primed to be perfect or not um yeah, but that's true but 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 it's actually through acting that you can make them perfect or not it, I, it's just i don't know like i i mean you can probably see it now like this is almost like just this is like pre-workout almost like you know no, like, i i i try i, I completely agree i completely agree it's crazy it's 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 a very very optimistic framework so oh yes um you doesn't like uh, doesn't doesn't reading this just like it, it changes my mindset yeah it honestly does where it's like uh, like i said i've been aggressive with every choice that's in like in front of me recently and i don't mean that in a bad way where it's like uh, this almost induces like a positive version of like burn the candle from both ends like not, no, I don't mean that in like the negative way where you kind of like die with like you know just like of like of lung cancer from cigarettes and AIDS or whatever you know what I mean. But like <laughs> from the candle from both ends. No, but but like don't don't you get the don't you get the like I dude this is like I it, it, I don't even know how to describe this feeling honestly, but it's like I'm just possibility. No. Yes, yes, just just yes. possibility. Yep. Yeah, when yeah, you, yeah. It's the line here, like towards the end. For no doctrine is more optimistic. The destiny of man is placed within himself. Like it is since at, right before that, it defines man by his action, right? So yes. simply by doing, you become. Yes. And, like, and he and he slanders people who retreat the into the sense of could have. You know, he 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 like he just lambasts people who are just like, you know, I could have done this but for this external reason or whatever it's like no actually <laughs> you didn't so you yeah, there, you didn't yes it, it was it was it was harsh but so true when he was just like yes. you are you are ultimately the sum of your actions like yeah. you you just are like we don't we don't it, imagine that you know like he said like we don't imagine that Proust could have like written like another great play. You know what I mean? We like, do not he... celebrate him for the for the uh, play that he did not write. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Or, or or his genius for you know the play that he did not write. I mean, his because yes. he's saying you know it, we don't you know judge an artist specifically by their works, but you know a person by their entire life, like all attributes, obviously. But yes. but it is based on the summation of your behavior. And your, and your actions yeah. so yes. it's it's so right though too <laughs> you, you yes. hate to read it but you need to read yeah, it i know you, <laughs> yes yeah, you, you shy away from it but yeah, you know. i mean how many millions of times have, has that been invoked even in subtle ways in your life you know yeah. like it's i hate to use the term but it's almost human nature <laughs> <laughs> it induced in me two juxtapositions that were very hard to shake mm. one was between me and disdain for people making obviously just like lazy choices around me like you know whenever i saw someone like just doing like the lazy thing that i know that they would regret it it, it like not necessarily at them but like at the action it created a disgust in my mind mm. and then it also created like this second juxtaposition between like I was very judgmental of myself when I wasn't doing something that I thought was like worthwhile or 
that I knew I needed to do, but like, wasn't, do you know what I mean? Like, mm. I'm, dude, I've got, I've got this long list of things that I'm trying to do before I move. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, you know, I'm like, okay. Um, you know, you, you, you're, you're watching like an next episode of Futurama right now, <laughs> but like, <laughs> but like, don't you kind of need to be like working on like the BMW to like get it ready to drive like 1200 miles? You know what I mean? It was just like, and, 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 and the, absolute psychological just ripped bare truth of the fact that like okay the little countdown on like the hulu thing is saying like 10 9 8 like i choose whether or not i hit pause or just let that countdown continue <laughs> yes it do it's just i don't know like a, this all sounds like banal unless you're in the right state of mind <laughs> No, I, I completely agree. Yes, I, yes. I, I think it's extremely optimistic in that sense. So, we, oh, so, we, yes, so, wait, so yes. it relates back to what you wanted to bring up there about mm. pessimism versus optimism. Yeah. I was going to ask you guys, like when I was reading this, nothing in me thought about or defaulted to the negative aspect of any of this. It was always just like there was this glorious calling towards like the positive pot potential like uh, i'm not saying that that is lo logically entailed that's just kind of psychologically what my experience of reading this was there was a little pessimism for me in yeah. the sense that in, in the sense that like there there really is no excuse to fall back on anything <laughs> you know what i mean like you ultimately are responsible for the sum of your actions mm. like it's you are what you've done you know what I mean? And also, even further, it's like you make these decisions alone, like in complete isolation. Yeah. And and there's like there's no higher power. There's no overarching narrative to anything. It's you just kind of find yourself in this world where you've got to define yourself and you're responsible for that. Yeah. And I think there is. I mean, there's like infinite possibility to it where there is like that optimism, you know, to it, mm -hmm. but also there is like a large burden to life. And I, and I it totally experienced that too. I almost coded that. I'm just like, you know, talk like mentally that almost was like, I'm feeling the energy of it now. And it's not necessarily negative. It's almost like, um, it almost resembles a physical sensation, which is very much like, you know how kind of the feeling of, um, you know, like the feeling of, you know, going up kind of like the incline on a roller coaster and you realize like, oh shit, this is actually like really, really tall. Yeah. And like that feeling is very similar to the feeling of maybe like right before you present something. Um, you know, for school or like a class or a conference or whatever. And it's also really similar to like walking up to a girl and like asking for her number at a bar or something. And it's also really similar. There are a lot of things that actually can be kind of coded. They're across the spectrum of positive and negative, but the physical sensation is almost the same of like your body is almost like buzzing with raw potential or just like raw ex anticipation yeah anticipation because excitement is too positively valence but it's like anti it's like raw anticipation yeah or like raw possibility because anticipation almost seems like it's going to happen to you but like i i don't know i was just like i was like <laughs> i, I don't with that. <laughs> yeah i i almost don't want to invoke it but it is the way you're describing it reminds me of annie yes yes <laughs> yes like the, yes. the awareness of that something is right in front of me yeah, <sighs> which makes her condition of being tired with life like all the more tragic. You know, it just it almost seemed like she didn't encounter someone like her. So, yeah. so, so as a result, it was like, I mean, it's uh, like, like, let me, like, let me think how like this relates back to the paper for a second here because it's almost like, um. If I may. Yeah, go ahead. It's almost just... like she was striving for a perfection. Like, if if you kind of define yourself by your actions, she's kind of was 
maybe she embraced the glory that Jordan was talking about. Like, <laughs> you know, why not just like try to achieve this perfection, right? Every moment can simply be seized upon, you know, um, and just <laughs> obviously um, Antoine was not the person to be with to, you know, define herself positively. You know what's weird though about that? Like, I, I think you're totally right, Giffen. Um, and and that actually strikes me as like very strange. Where you know, because because in nausea, Annie seems like kind of maybe the closest person to exemplifying Sartre's philosophy about this, right? Because it's definitely not Antoine, and <laughs> yeah, and the self-taught man doesn't give us, <laughs> doesn't give us a yeah. lot to go on. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it made me think like it's actually very strange that Annie could end up like that then because. Sartre's philosophy as put forth here is um he rejects it, quietism like literally the first thing he says after like the introduction well that but also he almost rejects the sense that the past matters at all it, it's it, this is you know I, I this is this view is almost sort of disallowing you from turning your head anywhere but 90 degrees like you can't look back in some sense with this philosophy um uh, in an I'm not sure I understand that actually. Hmm. Okay. But wait, it, from the paper you're referencing here, not from yeah. Nausea. No, no, no. From from the paper. It... Okay, because you could get the sense that, like, you could get the sense that okay, someone who buys this philosophy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, let's imagine that they actually kind of fail in life. Like they fail to achieve their dreams, their goals, their aspirations. Um, You might imagine that that person like having read this would actually like their lows would be even lower than the person who, you know, kind of doesn't have this mindset, right? Like, like I actually (laughs) deeply failed, you know, like you're, you're, you know, let's imagine the the excuses will like start to materialize, but then you'll, you already have the defense against it. Yeah. Right. And and you're sort of, you know, let's say you're 55 and you're like, fuck, fuck, dude. I actually just, I didn't do it. Like I didn't do X. I didn't accomplish Y. I, I like, I actually, my action is a low sum. And you might imagine that that person would have a, you know, valley deeper than any other valley because of this, you know, like it, it actually like the weight of my failure is on my shoulders and mine alone. But it's almost weird in the sense that like that seems like it's almost a um, teleological view of Sartre's philosophy where like all of this led to that moment. But it seems like Sartre would just like, you know, like slap that person across the face and just be like, you know, you choose how like you move forward with this next, you know, with, like 20, 30 years, whatever you have left. So it's almost like Sartre almost seems like this person who just sort of like backhands you. Like every time you try to kind of be like, I have failed. He, he's like, you failed so far, you fool. You know what I mean? Like, um, and in that sense, he, he almost seems to be like, you know, a very radical sense, disavowing thinking about the past or disavowing at least maybe being, having the sentiment that your journey is over or that you failed in some sense. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't know that I read that. Like I did not read Sartre as expressing that point of like disavowing looking in the past. Can I, can I add real quick? Uh, Cause I realized what I said could be interpreted in this like really motivational, like speech or speaker way, like Tony Robbins way. But I don't think Sartre would mean it in that sense. He's like, I think you would mean it in the sense of like, no bitch. They're like, the responsibility isn't over yet. Like you can't say you fail. You know what I mean? Like you can't, you can't wallow yet. You just made the choice to wallow. No, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, add to that extent. I, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of agree with both points there in the sense that like, yeah, I mean, you're not, you're not really negating the past. Like you still are like the sum of your actions. And like, mm-hmm. that is like a, a fair depiction of your life. Right. But at yes. the same time, it's like, you know, no matter how many years you've been slipping by uh, Taco Bell, <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> frankly, tomorrow's it, a new day. Yeah, yeah, tomorrow's a new day, and, 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 and that's gonna be a uh, that's gonna be another choice that you're gonna be mm. presented with. So, yeah. yeah, so yeah, so I I don't know if I would say he disavows it. Maybe more like 
cautions your reaction to it. Like, I, I don't think it's inconsistent with what he said here to like positively reflect on the past to inform decisions going forward. Right. Mm. Um, that doesn't mm-hmm. seem inconsistent, but like the wall, I can definitely, I can imagine the back, the backhand um, at like the wallowing. <laughs> right. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Poor choices, my friend. <laughs> you know, w- what you said is actually really insightful Giffen because that, that kind of circles back to one of my, like small kind of quibbles with what he was saying, but I, I almost thought that he kind of conflated determinism with fatalism in a lot of ways here. Um, where like, you know, he, he kind of rails against like determinism as being this like easy way out or he, he kind of, I mean, you know, his, he's not super clear, but he, I think the evidence is on the side of him denying that it's true in some robust sense. Um, But I I almost took his like, I almost took his target to be more of fatalism, where it's sort of like, no matter what happened, I was always going to be fat or like, lazy or um, like, yeah, not attaining this degree where where it's like, that's actually not kind of what determinism is saying. And so I don't know to what extent the deterministic or the determinism kind of debate was even formed at this point. But I very much got it's like, that he was not rejecting like kind of the philosophy here. He was like, you, you can't like fall into the, the, maybe the mindset that maybe that was like popular amongst those Mm -hmm, who like mm -hmm. were in the deterministic realm at the time. Like, I don't know where the conversation is, but it very much was like, you can't use that philosophy as an excuse as opposed to like, yeah, I deny this philosophy. Although he probably certainly did uh, yeah yeah i, I totally it's just not clear that. yeah yeah so yeah. I, I agree with you there because i was almost thinking about this um just you just kind of reflecting on the whole free will series that we did and um i, I was almost thinking about this in like uh the way john martin fisher might read this where he would just be able to love everything to the degree that we've loved it and see all of this in terms of guidance control as opposed to regulative control you know, remember we discussed that distinction where guidance control is like, um, you know, back to Adams, you know, you turn the car left, it goes left, you turn it right, it goes <laughs> right, you know, right into you... Taco Bell, <laughs> <laughs> left into oncoming traffic, right yeah. into Taco Bell. <laughs> Adam's a dilemma. <laughs> No choice is made, and I just plow right through like a, a, a stop sign I'm like on a school bus. <laughs> It's like that ultimately was my choice. Yeah. <laughs> like the cops are arresting you. Like you must choose. <laughs> yeah. I, I chose. I, I tell the cops that you must yeah. choose to arrest me or not. <laughs> They're like I, I choose to be. <laughs> yeah. Um. Like I, I I I I just think that like I think that I can very consistently be as motivated and loving of all of this without being in conflict with anything that we said in the free will debate um in a way that i think is probably sartre would disagree with but i'm like viewing this in a little bit of a softer way that he is but it's also like it's also like at the end of the day he's he's actually like damningly correct that you just are the sum of what you did like there's no I love I love when he talked about there's you can't retreat into this sense of like well could have and if things would have gone differently it's like okay like things only unfold one way like they just do and at the end of the day yeah. like you you literally are like um I feel like I've had this conversation with Adam before where um uh you know pe- people always be like oh like you, uh, you know like I, I see on like instagram all the time like back when i had it installed on my phone like pe- you know pe- people posting those kind of like pithy quotes about like like y- you're more than your resume and like you're, you're like you're thomas more than jefferson <laughs> thomas <laughs> Je- <laughs> you know i mean it's like you're more than like don't let x yeah. define you or whatever it's like um Sergio, like he, he, I, it does I, define you. Yeah, <laughs> backhand. Comes yeah, into play. I, I feel like there'd be backhand still <laughs> left and right where he's like, no, actually, like it, it, I feel like Sartre would kind of like he would do that Hitchens thing where he would like lean back, name one, 
just just one like <laughs> w- w- like name one thing actually that defines you that can't be pointed to or that can't be like what what is it is it your generosity okay you're exactly as generous as you have <laughs> you were. been in the past yes yes it's like okay it and yeah. and i've so always I, been drawn to that oh it that that is very consistent um even if it's not something you want to consciously be aware of all the time it is undeniable it's true it, um, it, but it, I it, a, it helps to be consciously aware of it though honestly it, oh no like it that, helps it's, it's just <laughs> it gut punch sometimes yeah. you know what i it mean it can be a little exhausting yeah that's what i that's a good way to phrase it mm. um but i actually wanted to i was curious because at the beginning it seemed like you guys had a little bit of um uncertainty or disagreement with sartre whenever he kind of maps kind of this onto humanity right but in the idea of like kind of just the aggregate sum if that's kind of the view he's thinking of humanity is just directly analogous to the view of like an individual. Do you guys agree with that? Wait, say that again. So we're just talking about like the person simply is the sum of what they do. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we've been discussing that for a couple um, for a while and everyone seems to be in agreement. What I was reading. And I think my belief has become a little stronger um, is that like, whenever he's talking about humanity and like how, like in the same way that like your actions define you, you as a human just define humanity because you're a part of that. Right. So I think that's kind of what he means. Like at the end, like if you kind of like aggregate everyone's lives, like that's what humanity was. Right. So you, I mean, it's, it's much less personal in the sense, but it is like you you just directly contribute to what humanity ends up being simply by like your choices. Giffen, I, 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 I do agree with you. I just, I still wonder though, because it's like, this is like one of the foundational premises of like existentialism. Like this is like what he begins with, right? I feel like if he would have like built up to that, that would maybe be, I would maybe interpret it in that light a little more, but it's almost like, okay, here's found, here's like premise one, like, like when you act, you act for like all of humanity pretty much. Mm. And it's almost like I wish you would have laid out maybe like this sense of radical freedom, you know, and how actions, you know, kind of define oneself and how oneself in a way then defines humanity. Maybe rather than like opening with, okay, your actions define humanity. Do you kind of get the difference? Oh, I mean, yeah, no, hundred percent. I'm not saying it was formulated it comes well off as here, stronger but... as like the opening kind of principle to existentialism. So. What do you make of these two quotes? He says, but in truth, one ought always to ask oneself, what would happen if everyone did as one is doing? So every man ought to say, am I really a man who has the right to act in such a manner that humanity regulates itself by what I do? I like that, 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 um, I don't know, like if, given like your, your mm-hmm. thought there seems congruent with what he's saying but he like Sartre almost seems to be like grasping at something deeper than that which is what so, I disagree yeah. with I think no I I would agree it's like I what I have kind of described I think is con- you know it's consistent with what he's laid mm-hmm. out but it doesn't seem like it is the only thing that would be consistent and I you do kind of feel this background kind of like what more is he trying to convey but yeah, I don't know. I get the impression that he was more directing these kind of um, like phrases towards people who might be skeptical, mm. right? Like this is very much like a lay audience in in this a lot is of these a defensive speech, yeah, right. Of so yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, again, I, I can read this into it, and it's not inconsistent. But I, I, you know, I can't say for certain. Like maybe if we read the longer version of like the actual book, he would be more specific about what he's kind of going for there. Um, like it does seem kind of just like folk advice thrown in there in a way it's like <laughs> do what you know imagine that everyone did what you did i don't um, know that that line is making a much stronger claim do you almost get the sense also given that like um his his uh his focus around self-creation also seems to be intentional with that too where it's like okay if like everyone is in a position to radically create themselves then people are like deeply not in the same position then to like um but pe- pe- people he's literally saying like people are free to be different people then um like not act 
as though all of humanity should follow you. Um, because that seems to like imply that there's not a freedom in what like the rest of humanity can do. I don't think that he's saying that everyone should. I think this is more of like a psychological kind of react, anticipating a psychological reaction from people in that like by s- uh, almost a, a, like a, a defense a, against moral relativism or something. Here's what I'm imagining. So whenever I remember I was just giving the pitch, this is where it's kind of, again, consistent, but not the only thing that could be consistent Mm -hmm. that like Sartre is kind of like, you know, perhaps in the wrong order and less than eloquently. But if he is saying, you know, humanity will just end up being the sum of humans, right? Mm -hmm. Like if he wants you to conceptualize that, I think this would be an example that he could be like, if you imagine, you know, um, you know, everyone doing as you do, like that might help you come to terms with the idea that like the, what otherwise might be a vague notion of like you define humanity. Right. Like, you know what what I'm saying? Like if he was going to say like, okay, in the same way that you are the sum of your actions, humanity is the sum of humans. Right. If he says that he's like, okay, that might be something that's hard to conceptualize, which it is much harder than the individual um, thing. Here's an exercise. Imagine that everyone did as you did, like, that can help you kind of your actions conform to the reality in that sense. Right. So I don't know. And now it is, I think still consistent that he is um, with like what is written that he would be making some sort of larger claim than that. But that's kind of what I've read it as. But again, like there's probably some larger claim buried in like the, the novel version of this, you know, the transcript. Yeah, I just honestly, I don't know. Oh yeah, I don't know either. I I seem to just have come come to peace with the fact that it might be what I described it. There's some lack of inconsistency. Um, there just seems like me. such a there just seemed like such a big tension between that and almost like the the rest of the work. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't think you're wrong in any sense. I, yeah, I don't think he's saying like humanity ought follow or anything like that i don't think he was trying to destroy the individual there i think it's just like if you want to internalize like more intuitively your responsibility here's an exercise that might make you feel that right yeah it's it's honestly hard to square that with this quote though that i read from him so every man ought to say am i really a man who has the right to act in such a manner that humanity regulates itself by what i do like that Okay, here are like the two things that just, uh, uh, you know, again, like I'm not trying to get like, but th- this just seems like it's intention with me. So, okay, am I really a man who has the right to act in such a manner? Well, he's already said that like rights almost don't exist in some sense in his philosophy where I, I, I almost like r- rights are almost sort of, sort of subsumed by one fundamental right to choose. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, there's no like inalienable right. Yeah. yeah. And then the second half of that, such that humanity regulates itself by what I do. Well, you know, regulation again implies like a lack of choice, but but you would have to sort of acquiesce to the regulation there. So I, I, it, like, I just I, I find that confusing when juxtaposed to the rest of what he's saying here. Yeah, it is. It is tough. It, it, it sounds like he's making a stronger claim. Like I just found like another quote that like I kind of marked myself, but like, here, here's one as well that kind of supports Jordan's position. Or if to take a more personal case, I decide to marry and to have children, mm. even though this decision proceeds simply from my situation, from my passion or my desire, I am thereby committing not only myself, but humanity as a whole to the practice of monogamy. I am thus responsible for myself and for all men. And I'm creating a certain image of man as I would have him to be. I am fashioning myself, in fashioning myself, I fashion man. So that last quote almost is like what Giffen was describing there, but it's like, Mm. but lines like, okay, (laughs) I am thereby committing not only myself, but humanity as a whole to the practice of monogamy yeah and i'm actually kind of curious if this would be kind of clarified somewhat if we were able to read the original french um because Mm -hmm. this is like something where very small subtleties would have a huge impact i feel like 
like yeah. committing mankind to monogamy can be kind of interpreted as in like you know the soft way which is like humanity will be at least in some ways monogamous if some humans are monogamous right even a single person if there was only a single human who is monogamous well two i guess you know who are practicing <laughs> monogamy um wow. then human <laughs> I'm not sure that that's what monogamy is, but regardless, um, <laughs> um, like you, you because like Only humanity would have to include that monogamy, right? <laughs> so like that's a soft version of um, the claim, but the the harder version that seems actually the, the easier to read from this is like <laughs> whenever you choose monogamy, like <laughs> everyone else must follow almost. Like that is kind of almost what could be read into it right like you you commit mankind to monogamy has like a ring to it that does seem to be of a grander scale than like the, the soft version that i described first where it's like well it will you, humankind will have to involve monogamy in some way because you know or, or or that you think others should be monogamous true right? yeah yeah right? I, I, there's that's an almost how i read it like kind the of first read time. in there yeah and, and like, is, is that necessarily true either? Like, I don't, I don't think like everything I do, everyone must do, right? Like I, no, maybe fact, he's, there, in I fact, mean, there even, are idiosyncratics, uh, idiosyncrasies about me, which would actually make like other people doing what I like to do unhappy to them. Like, I, th that just, that, that seems to be like, is, you know, that, that, that is what it means to act from, like self-interest or not self-interest like a, like a, i'm putting top spin on that but like um like 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 giffen you acting in like this radical freedom is going to look differently than me acting in it and it's good like i i, I don't know like you're yeah. gonna do certain things that i don't want to do and i'm going to do certain things that you don't want to do yeah I, so again if if you read it softly i think it's i can i kind of have like this kind of mm. um view that seems to be not inconsistent but it is very easy to read from this something that we would all disagree with i think and it seems to be inconsistent with some of the other things in its if there's any aughts being read in there oh, though maybe maybe he's saying like i don't know <laughs> by your action you imply an ought to humanity for if you were in that position which is kind of relates back to like one of the earlier quotes we were talking about i don't know it, it's it's difficult if you try to like take it very literally because it, it, I'm not sure it squares. This is one of those classic instances where honestly, like the, the more we've talked about it, like the more I'm very confused at the paradox there. Like the more I'm, I'm having like a really hard time squaring that. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting it by simply by ignoring it. It's, it seems like it, there's a soft version that can be read and I'm reading that. And, and I, don't, I, I, I don't the think the hard versions I simply like reject. Well, I, like, and I don't even think that that's a wrong way to read it because I've done all of that too from the sense of I've been just fawning over and like gushing over this because I'm yeah. reading all of it in John Martin Fisher's regulative or um, um, guidance control guidance sense. Control. Do you know what I mean? So like, again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't read this and like, <laughs> this was disappointed. You can, you can kind of read out the actual like deterministic arguments pretty easily yeah. so i don't even th I, like i was just saying that by way of commenting that i don't think that's a disingenuous way to like re read oh, this yeah no, that's fair. um did you guys have anything there was kind of one like small last thing that i had but were there any other topics that you found noteworthy no i i'm, I'm about to you can cut this out if you'd like to but i'm <laughs> I'm, I'm about You're about to engage avoid. in some monogamy and then go to bed. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm about to pass the fuck out. Honestly, like, here's the thing. Had we started at nine of and course. I didn't drink the wine, I think I would have been okay. But I think, honestly, drinking that wine on top of just having been up since 6 a.m., mm. I'm about to, like, pass the fuck out. That's fair. So, <laughs> yeah. No, I'll just mention them. That's, like, the, the last thing that I really liked about this um was it very congruently and parsimoniously lended itself to the idea of kind of again it, 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 this was almost this almost seemed to follow from his sense of like okay you are courageous exactly to the extent by which you act over your fear 
and like not an, an ounce more and not an ounce less. And following that, he has this quote, um, man is all the time outside of himself. It is in projecting and losing himself beyond himself that he makes man to exist. And on the other hand, it is by pursuing transcendent aims that he himself is able to exist. And at first I didn't get what he meant by that. And I sat with it for a while and I thought like, actually it might be one of the most profound lines in the, in, in the speech there, because he's kind of talking about the idea that <laughs> you actually don't exist. Like there is no you separate from what you pursue and what you aim at and sort of like what you strive for. And he's talking about like finding meaning in the pursuit of, I don't know, like for for lack of a better word, like difficult shit. You know what I mean? Like it, he's almost, um, um, there's almost less of you in some sense when you plop down and just like watch, you know, some bullshit TV for like, you know, two hours after, after work or whatever, like there's almost kind of less of you in some sense, you know, like when he says, you know, it is in projecting and losing himself beyond himself that he makes man to exist. Like, I just, I don't know that, that I I really like that. Yeah. Um, Yeah. He has a lot of quotes in here that are, optimistic until you realize the gravity that is involved with them you know these yeah a lot of this could almost sound like you know it written in cursive with a magenta pastel background on instagram or whatever but when you actually realize what he's saying it's like whoa 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 there's actually some like deep deep coloration like underneath that you know yeah no it was it was quotable um and i think the the weight of responsibility can be distinguished from a pessimism, right? It's a weight, yes, but it's not yes. a pessimism. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's you may kind of find yourself choosing to be depressed <laughs> after reading it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. He definitely has this very like um, Eastern European, like you're choosing to be sad kind of, <laughs> kind of vibe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I think, I think that that's not a bad note to end on. Um, I really, I really enjoy this. And this actually, um, uh, this changed my view of Sart- Sartre, very, like very much so. Uh, I'm glad we didn't just read nausea and then ditch him. No, I'm, <laughs> that would have been pretty catastrophic. I'm really glad we, you suggested this, Kevin. Yeah, yeah, we, we would have committed slander <laughs> <laughs> for, the, for the rest of our lives. We would have chose villainy. Yes, <laughs> yes, we yes, would have chosen villainy. Uh, all right. Well, I think we're doing um, Camus was a contemporary of Sartre, I believe. Uh, they both lived in France at the same time uh, and had a friendship and a famous falling out, I believe. Uh, so I think we'll be doing The Stranger by Camus next. So, um, so if you enjoyed this, which I hope you did, stay tuned for next episode. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Plato's Cave. Um, I always enjoy discussing topics with uh, with these two guys. So if you want to um, support the show in any way, you can do so simply by sharing it. Uh, I'm hoping to get this show out to more people. Uh, and so if you want to share it on Twitter or social media, that would really help me. Uh, you can also rate it on Apple Podcasts. Uh, like this video if you're watching on YouTube, or subscribe uh, via Apple Podcasts or an RSS feed. Uh, you can also discuss it on your own show and link back uh, to my website, or you can connect me uh, with recommended guests or topics to cover. Uh, you can get in contact with me at Plato's Cave Podcast at gmail.com, follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore C underscore Myers. And I now have a website for my philosophy endeavors at jordanmyers.org. If you want to know a little bit more about me and my fellow co-hosts, as I said in the introduction, I'm a master's student in philosophy at the University of Houston. I did my undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh, where I studied mechanical engineering and philosophy. And now that I'm back at school, I'm hoping to more closely study uh, moral responsibility, free will, ethics, epistemology, and moral psychology. Those are topics that I was uh, introduced to and got really interested in in my undergrad work. So 
Uh, Adam and Giffen accompanied me on this show, and Adam is uh, one of my oldest friends. We actually met in kindergarten, um, and we've been interested in philosophical topics for as long as we can remember, and in a lot of ways, it's been the basis of our friendship. Uh, Adam studied chemistry and biology at Cornell, and he is currently working at a law firm. Um, And he's especially interested in moral responsibility as well, but also law, religion, and free will. Uh, Giffen is also one of my oldest friends, and uh, we've been friends since elementary school as well. Um, Giffen studied biology and economics at RPI, and now he works in human health research. Uh, He believes that there's very interesting overlap between both of his fields of study and philosophy, and he's particularly interested in exploring political philosophy. So this series was right up his alley. Um, And with with all of that information, again, I hope that you enjoyed uh, this episode, and I hope that you get in contact with me or or follow my work in any way that you uh, deem reasonable to do. So with that, thank you for listening.